Hello everyone, thanks for watching. My name is Johan Peltenberg and I will give a brief introduction to in-memory processing with Apache Arrow. In this lecture, we will briefly go over the following topics. We will cover in-memory processing and how it differs from traditional disk-based methods, such that you understand how modern data-intensive applications can be made faster. We will talk about two in-memory data layout techniques, arrays of, array of structs versus structure of arrays. And here you will learn the difference between row-oriented and column-oriented in-memory layouts of tabular data. And in this way, you can uh, know when to apply which. We will then introduce the Apache Arrow project where the column-oriented layout is applied. And we will go over additional benefits that the project provides to data-intensive applications. We will dive a little bit deeper into Apache Arrow and briefly show how also nested and variable length data is efficiently laid out in memory such that you understand why it performs well. And finally, we will introduce a short lab that can help you get a feeling of how much computational performance can be gained by using something like Apache Arrow. Now, what is in-memory processing and how does it differ from traditional means of processing large data sets? In traditional relational database management systems, data is stored in slow spinning disks that mechanically retrieve the bits and bytes of information, while for in-memory processing, the data resides in the DRAM or flash. Now, retrieving data from a spinning disk takes a tremendous amount of time compared to retrieving it from a DRAM or flash. But people used to do that because the cost of storing a bit of information was very low for spinning disks and their information capacity was relatively high. But nowadays, DRAM and Flash are becoming relatively cheap and they can also have a high information capacity. Traditional relational databases are typically optimized for insertion, deletion, and retrieval of single records, but not really to do large-scale analytics of the data. While for in-memory processing, uh, we see that it focuses more on extracting statistics or deriving models based on a relatively large subset of the data or sometimes the whole data set. Now, finally, to support these two kinds of use cases for these two kinds of systems, traditional systems store data in a row-oriented fashion, uh, and in-memory processing systems store data in a column-oriented fashion. Now, what that means exactly is something we will learn in the next couple slides. So to understand the difference between row-oriented and column-oriented uh, data formatting, let's consider a database of a fleet of cars. So we will look at this a little bit. We will look at this a uh, little bit of C++ code showing the definition of a structure named car record consisting of several fields. Uh, each car record in our database has a brand ID, its current mileage, uh, uh, three RGB values for a color, and the uh, name of the model as a pointer to a C string. Now, the, the most straightforward way of storing many car records is just to create an array of cars, as shown at the bottom of the code snippet here. And this is called an array of structures, because this is an array of many of these structures, car records. Now, we've shown a few colored boxes behind each field here, uh, representing the bytes of information of that field. Now, when we look at how these bytes of information are laid out in a one-dimensional random access memory, we will find that for this example, the compiler lays them out in a memory, uh, the compiler lays them out in memory on a record-by-record -record basis. So first, uh, we have the brand ID of car zero, then the mileage of car zero, and so forth, until all the fields have been placed in memory. To make matters a little bit more complex, there are no rules about how many bytes may be padded by a compiler to, to such a structure. So for my compiler, it padded five bytes to make sure the structure has 24 bytes in total. So here's a little bit of padding as well. Now, following this first structure for the first car is the second uh, structure for the second car where these fields are consecutively placed in memory uh, again uh, until we place all the cars in memory. A final thing, a final thing to note, but please park uh, it for now, as this will come back a little bit later, is that there are a few pointers pointing to other seemingly random places in the memory where the strings are. So here we have the F series string for the first car, and then we have the second car, which is a Silverado. 
and this string is placed somewhere else in memory. Now let's first move to the next slide where we will take a look at how we can perform a typical query on this information. So in this slide we'll expose one drawback of the arrays of uh, array of structures approach for our data set by looking at an example query. Now let's say we are interested in summing up all car mileages to discover the total mi miles driven by all cars in the data set. Also let's consider we're interested in doing so quickly using SIMD uh, instructions where we can sum multiple values with one instruction. Now when we load the data from main memory we load a whole cache line from the main memory into our cache, not just one value. So for illustration purposes, I've made the cache lines here a little bit shorter, uh, just 16 bytes, but they typically contain 64 to 128 bytes for modern server grade machines. So after loading this cache line, it now holds a lot of information surrounding the mileage field that we're interested in, uh, but we actually don't use all this other information in our, our calculation. So we've spent precious time and energy loading a whole lot of bytes of which we only use a few. And we also need to perform many loads because of the fields, because the fields of interest are pretty far apart. And um, because of, um, and because of all these other fields that are not uh, of interest are in between and also the padding is in between. So a minor issue related to this being done in C++ is that we also waste quite some space um, on the structure padding, right? So in our case, there's five bytes times the number of records in our data set being padded. Uh, but this is a, uh, usually not, not a big issue. Now there must be an approach of storing this data in such a way that we can uh, better benefit from the cache in combination with our SIMD operation, because you know once we've loaded this data, we have these four bytes and we move them to the SIMD registers and then we perform a uh, uh, sum. And again, we've wasted all these other bytes. We're not doing anything with those. Now, a better way of doing that is uh, shown on the next uh, slide. So on this slide, let's, let's take a look at a better approach within our context. So rather than creating an array of structures, we can also create a structure where each field is an array holding the consecutive values of the corresponding fields of our car record. So hence this method is called structure of arrays. So rather than storing first the brand ID, then the mileage, and then the color, etc., we first consecutively store all brand IDs, then all mileages and so forth. Now, when we load the first mileage value over here, uh, we get the second, third, and fourth one in our cache as well for free because that's just how uh, how computers work. They load a whole cache line. So we can just move those to the SIMD register right away and perform the sum. And that's much faster than and more efficient than having, a, uh, having to do four separate loads, loading four separate cache lines with a lot of information that we don't need before we can perform the SIMD operation like we saw on the previous slide. So we just used all data from a single load and wasted uh, no bytes. Now let's relate what we've just learned uh, to the terms row oriented and, and column oriented. So for the array of structures, each record or C++ struct represents one row in a table. Now each column of the table is split over multiple structs and the table is laid out in a one dimensional memory row by row. And that therefore we call this approach row oriented when we're talking about uh, representing a table. Now for the structure of arrays, each row is split over multiple arrays and each array represents a column of the table. So the table is laid out in a one dimensional memory column by column and therefore we call this column oriented. Now this term terminology doesn't just apply to data sets placed in random access memory, but also to some file formats that can be either column oriented or row oriented. For example, CSV files are row oriented, but Apache Parquet files are column oriented. 
We've looked at a very simple data structure now and we still have some loose ends to tie up. For example, we haven't talked about the strings in our example of the model field. They were stored as a pointer to some additional memory in the same way for both row oriented and column oriented. But it turns out that we can also lay out variable length data structures such as strings in a smarter way, such that they are easier to process by modern hardware. Now one in memory processing project that really focuses on storing all sorts of more complex types of data in a column oriented fashion is Apache Arrow. We'll first introduce Apache Arrow before we will show what we can do with the strings. Apache Arrow is a project by the Apache Software Foundation. At its core, there is a specification for columnar in memory tabular datasets. The format is similar, but not exactly like our structure of arrays example. It's a bit more advanced. So there is one format, but, but there are many libraries for various programming languages that implement APIs to work with Arrow data in your language of choice. Uh, but as I record the, the record, there are about 12. So there are also a few third party frameworks such as NVIDIA CUDF and Fletcher that help in using Arrow data on GPUs and FPGAs. Normally when we pass data between different types of processes, we have to perform what is called serialization and deserialization of data. Now serialization is when we go from uh, some language native in memory format for our, uh, of our data to some common format just used during exchange of the data. And deserialization is the other way around. So for example, suppose we want to send some data from Spark, which is written in Scala, to Pandas, which is written in, in, um, in Python. Then we need to copy the data and convert it a few times before the Scala representation of the data is turned into something uh, that uh, is turned into a, a Python representation of the data. Now this wastes a lot of time and energy while we haven't even performed any useful computation yet. Now Arrow also provides a protocol to construct inter-process communication uh, messages that can be passed between processes. Now remember the in-memory format of Arrow data is the same for all programming languages uh, and, and the same in all applications that use that data. So we don't have to convert anything to use the data from, from Spark to Pandas. In fact, when using shared memory, we don't even have to copy any data at all. This is why, uh, this is what is called a zero copy inter-process communication and Arrow provides some ways of, of doing that. Uh, Arrow also provides a framework for remote procedure uh, uh, calls related to exchanging Arrow data, but we will not really go into detail in, uh, in this lecture. But what we will do is uh, we will take a look at some parts of the in-memory format specification of Arrow. Now the Arrow, for the Arrow format specification explains how we can lay out specific types of tabular data in memory. I'll introduce some Arrow specific terminology here. So I will colorize these words just to make sure you don't confuse them with their more generic interpretation. Uh, that you may know from, from other courses or maybe some other uh, projects that you worked on. So a tabular data structure is called a record batch. So on the right, I've, I've shown a uh, somewhat similar, but not exactly the same type of data as in our previous example with the cars data set. So the record, the record batch has a, um, a schema, which has the field names and types of each field in a record. Uh, the types of each field of a record or of a row. So this is a record. These are the field names and these are the field types. And these top two columns basically form the schema. Um, now each column is represented as an arrow array. And each arrow array consists of one or multiple arrow buffers uh, that somehow they relate together to form a represent to form the uh, to form a representation of the data. So how they relate together depends on the data type. So we will go into that on the next couple slides, and let's first take a look at the first two arrow arrays. So the first arrow array for the brand identifier just holds a fixed size primitive, a a 32-bit unsigned integer. This is only one 
So Arrow lays this out as only one buffer and it's similar or exactly the same like a C-like array. So this is a values buffer since it just holds elementary values of the data set. Now the second arrow array for the mileage column is al also holds a fixed size primitive, but the data is nullable. That means that values can be missing from this column for whatever reason. So it may be that someone uh, didn't manage uh, didn't manually enter uh, the mileage or maybe the odometer is broken for a car or something so the reason depends on the application but the takeaway is that error supports have having null values and it does so by introducing a second buffer called the validity bitmap buffer or just a validity buffer so we see it over here so when at some index a bit is one the data is considered to be valid or not null and we can use it to, for example, do some calculations. When at some index the bit is zero, the data is considered to be invalid, missing or null. There's still some space reserved in the values buffer, but we don't care what kind of data is in there because the data is invalid. So depending on the computation performed, you'll have to come up with some strategy to mitigate the data being null. But that is the, con but that is the concern of the specific application, not, not of Arrow. Now let's look at the last two arrow arrays of our record badge. So the color array holds a struct with three fields that are primitives. So there are three uint eights uh, representing a RGB value. Uh, so structures are flattened in arrow in a columnar fashion as well. So all values in a specific field of the struct are stored in a separate buffer. In this case, there's one buffer for the R values one buffer for the G values and one buffer for the B values. The last array here holds strings. Now a string is a variable size data structure which is a bit harder to lay out in memory. For, for fixed size data, to find the data for a specific row we can just multiply the size of the fixed size data by the row index and then we, we know where to look. But for strings in arrow we store the characters of the strings in, in one values buffer um, but we point to the start of each string from a second buffer, which is called the offsets buffer. Now the offsets in this buffer point to where a specific string starts in the values buffer. And by checking the next offset and calculating the difference, we know the size of the string. Let's take a closer look on the next slide and we will compare it to what we've seen earlier in our structure of arrays example, where we didn't really care about the strings yet. So remember that in our structure of arrays example in C, we store the strings as pointers to a piece of runtime allocated um, a memory where the string characters are. So the string characters are terminated by some special character, the null, termina null terminator character, so we can know the length of the string. So actually there's like a little hidden character here. Um, so the drawback of this is, however, that the string characters can be spread out all over memory and only, in the, and only the pointers are contiguously placed in memory. So the pointers here are contiguous, but the, strings, the string characters can be all over the place. So when we iterate over a column of strings, we get a limited ben benefit from our cache. Only if these string characters would be very close to each other, coincidentally, we, we would get some uh, ben benefit from the cache. Now in the arrow case where we have uh, the offsets buffer and the values buffer, it's slightly different. So the offset is like a pointer, but together with the next offset, it also stores the size. So it also stores the size. So we don't need a string terminator character like the null character in C. And we also don't need to store the length of the string separately like is typically done for, for example, a C++ or Java string in memory. Now also our characters are stored contiguously in memory so um, we get the benefits of our, of our cache again when iterating through a column of strings. Now, another approach that we sometimes see in applications is that the string length followed by the characters or all string lengths and then all characters are stored in contiguous buffers. But that's hard to parallelize because to find the start of some string, you need to prefix some, you need to do a prefix sum of all the lengths in order to figure out where some uh, string starts. 
So like we said before, there's a lot more to Arrow than we can show in this presentation. Uh, there's a lot of other data types that are supported, such as unions, dictionaries, tensors, and, and some others. And um, there is also the Arrow Flight Framework for remote procedure calls for Arrow data. And there are already quite some computational kernels that operate on Arrow data structures. There's also a framework that helps doing SQL-like or there's actually multiple frameworks that help doing SQL-like queries on Arrow data, such as Gandiva, that does runtime code generation and compilation for um, SQL expressions. And there's a lot of other exciting things going on in the Arrow project, so be sure to check out the website and the mailing list to get the latest information. So we conclude this lecture by looking back for a second. We talked about traditional disk-based methods of data analytics versus the relatively new in-memory processing methods. We've seen that a column-oriented layout of data is often most suitable for workloads typical of in-memory processing because it works well on modern CPUs with caches and SIMD. And we've also looked at the Apache Arrow project that provides a columnar in-memory format with, that is widely supported in many pro programming languages and even in GPUs and FPGAs, and we've delved a bit deeper into the Apache Arrow format by looking at how specific types of information are efficiently laid out in memory.